Hey everyone, we're back here on the Whirling Circle, Circles, Circle, One Circle, Whirling Circles Internal Art of uh, Martial Arts Podcast, um, joined by Frank Allen of the Wudang PCA and John Molinar, and I'm your host, other co-host, Sean Garcia. Um, thanks for tuning in again this week. We've been having um, some really uh, great feedback on the show. I forgot to mention last week that um, there's been more, in addition to us getting a little bit more subscribers on YouTube, there's more people engaging and having conversations on there. Um, you know, so people who are part of the Wudang, people who are supporters of the Wudang, and then some some people who are just coming around our videos. So that's really exciting to see. And, um, you know, we definitely appreciate all the feedback and positive comments. There hasn't been any trolling yet, um, thankfully, but it will come, I'm sure, soon. The trolls will come. Um, but for the time being, it's been all positive. It's, when you get famous is when the trolls start. That's what that's what happens. It's kind of a, it's kind of a give and take on that. Um, but yeah, so thank you for everybody's uh, um, comments and everything on there. That's been really awesome to see. And um, yeah, last week we had a really good topic. This week we're moving into a little bit of a, a bio um, topic. We're going to be speaking about one person in particular. And so uh, we hope you enjoy the conversation. It's a little, a little bit different than things that we did in the past. Um, so this week, uh, before we get into the topic, let's check in with our other co-hosts and see how they're doing. John, how are you feeling this week? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Um, yeah, just like last week, still ready for winter to be over. I think um, it's time for spring. Yeah. And you, you got, have you got, you've gotten your vaccine, you said, right? So I've gotten the first dose, uh, and the 27th, I think I get the second dose. Uh, my friends that have gotten the second dose have indeed confirmed that that's the one that, um, you feel sick afterwards, but, uh, so far, no one I know have, has gotten really knocked down by that second dose of the vaccine. They just have a couple days where they feel sort of flu like. Um, so no so third arm growing out or anything like that. I'm so disappointed. I would love to have a third arm as long as it's under my control and not uh, like under the control of my sub subconscious, like hitting me all the time or something. Um, no, that would be, that would be great. Third arm, <laughs> tentacle, tail, wings, wings are good as long as they're functional. <laughs> Frank, how you feeling? I'm cool. I'm cool. The usual stuff. I mean, I don't mind staying in the house, so it's all been fine for me. Yeah, I feel like we did a, a episode recently on Chi, and I actually feel like some of the um, stay at home, um, being able to like just relax a little bit, has been helpful for my Chi because sometimes you go, you both know me. I'm kind of running around doing too many things, being too many places, and definitely feel the effects on my Chi. So I've been I've been I've been enjoying that as well, uh, some at home time and just relaxing. But, you know, some cabin fever sometimes when all the girls are here and we're <laughs> on top of each other <laughs> if in a New York lived, City apartment. If I lived as high up as many flights of stairs as you do, I'd have cabin fever. I mean, but you don't want to go out because it's all those stairs, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Frank, you don't know. I live on a, a sixth floor walk up. And so, um, yeah, whenever someone has to go to the grocery store to get something like a bag of chips or something is like we're doing rock, paper, scissors to see who has to go down because it's such a pain in the I cannot imagine that you would go out for a, ch for a, for a bag of chips. You got to wait until there is not a single thing left in the house to eat. And then you're like, okay, let's, let's go out and buy some stuff. Yeah. No, well, my, first, my first 40 years in New York, I lived in tenement walk-ups. And I Same. never lived below the third floor. Third, fourth, fifth, all of them. So I had a, a lot of that going before. Oh, man, there was a time before um, I used to be a for those who don't know, I used to own a fitness studio. But before we owned the fitness studio, we used to do parks uh, classes in the park, um, which is fine. But we would do it with kettlebells. And so we would have around like 500 pounds of kettlebells that we would have to take down every Saturday morning, carry back up every Saturday morning after classes. 
roll around in a wheel cart. But it, it, um, what we ended up doing is that the bringing equipment up, we would recruit students. So we're like, all right, post workout, cool down, come help us carry 500 pounds of kettlebells up, up six flights of stairs. But uh, I was definitely in sh- <laughs> more in shape. <laughs> It was it was a challenge though, New York City life. All right, cool. So yeah, so um, this week we're going to be um, speaking about. Le- Le- Tell me if I'm pronouncing his name right. I always say it, but I'm like, am I saying it right? Leo Jinru. Am I saying close? Leo, Leo Jingru. Leo Jingru. I'm always I'm I'm bad with the Chinese names. John John and I can relate on that one. We're like listening to Frank tell stories, and you're just dropping tons of names. I'm like, how the heck? One, yes. do you pronounce all these so well? I mean, you got the tongue for it for sure. You've worked on it, but how do you memorize all the names? Well, sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't, and I don't always get it right. We had Tina watch Tina reacting to some of them. I mean, <laughs> they sound good, but they're not necessarily correct. <laughs> so you're faking the funk, they and then Tina's like, us. <laughs> "They sound Tina's good to like, us, Frank." <laughs> well, wasn't there a period speakers. where? Um, a lot of the historic names that you were saying for a while were incorrect, and then Tina or someone else came and finally like revised them all. Yes. <laughs> How long was that a, going for? That was our Chinese words in general. <laughs> what you you act like it's ended? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, language ac- acquisition is real. Um, you know, because okay, part, part of it is, I, is that you get in the tongue for it. You know. Well, you know. I correct her English, but her English is a whole lot better than my Chinese. That's right. That's right. You know, the only thing there is they don't have prepositions. Mm. So they have problems with where to put the prepositions. Mm-hmm. So a lot of stuff lost in translation. All right, cool. Yeah, so we're going to be we're gonna speak about uh, Liu Jingru, who, for those who don't know, um, is part of our lineage at the Wudang, um, you know, a Bagua master, uh, primarily in the Cheng style, right? But he knows a few, the other styles and systems, right? But primarily, and and uh, we'll get into kind of like who he is and and um, you know how we connected with him. We talked about it in past episodes, um, but we wanted to dedicate a whole episode um, to speaking about him and and his contribution to uh, martial arts and of course Baguazhang and the internal practices. So. <coughs> Get that cough out, Frank. How do you how do you want to get started with this uh, bio? Well, I just I'm going to throw out some factoids, and then we can discuss afterwards. You know, I'll throw one out. We'll see what we have to say about it. What we can add to it, or we can segue off of it. And go on to the next one. Awesome. Let's do it. Okay. Now, first, I want to mention that as of a couple of years ago, Liu Jing Ru was promoted to Ninth Duan. The Duan system is the Chinese national government martial arts ranking system, and nine is as high as you can get. It theoretically is a 10 Duan system, but I don't think anyone in the history of the system has ever been given a 10. And no other Bagua people were ever given a nine, which means that China is recognizing him as the number one Bagua expert in the country. A lot of it has to do with he's in his mid 80s and still teaching and still writing and still recording and still doing everything. And we've been studying with him since 2005. We made, I think it's about 15 or 16 trips that we studied with him. And he's just a really, really great guy as well as a wonderful teacher and, and tremendous skills, but also just a tremendous person overall. Uh, he was born in 1936 in Gaoyang County, Hebei Province. Of course, I was like, where the hell is that? So I looked it up, and it turns out that Jonathan and I have been there many, many times. Mm. Oh, really? Because, yeah, because that's where Bao Ding is. And Bao Ding, of course, is the place where oh. the most common place to see the Great Wall and visit the Great Wall that we went to over and over again for our first decade of going to China before we decided, well, we've, we've seen that and we'll let the other people go while we hunt down the brew pubs. But, right. Uh, no more but, trips to the Great Wall. 
please. <laughs> but we went there many times in our first decade of going to China. And, and Baoding is a great part of that province. And in fact, the most noted place in that province. And, and so, as you know, it's just a little southwest of Beijing. And that's where Liu Jingru was born. Okay. Do we know if he was born in a, is there like a city or town or like, do we know what type of environment he grew up in? I haven't Not really. seen it. I haven't okay. seen it. Because I, be I don't remember any town it, that we went by when we were going to the Great Walls, but maybe it's well, just ba a totally different. There's a Baoding town city also. Maybe that's where he's okay. from. But there are probably okay. other ones. And, yeah, interesting um, enough, too, that was around the time where, um, for, you know, for those who are into the history, that's also kind of like when uh, the Red Army for the, the eventually would be the Chinese Revolution in forty nine. Uh, the Red Army was starting to kind of grow in numbers around that time. So that's an interesting time to be born in China, for sure. A lot of well, political turmoil developing and, you know. Oh yeah, 19, then, 1936 then a, is right right the middle of what they call the warlord era, mm -hmm. where you had the, the republic, but now being run by Chiang Kai-shek, Mm -hmm. who was as much a warlord as anyone else. In fact, he was totally connected to, and some people say a member of the famous Green Gang. And then you had the communists starting to develop, and they actually were starting in the cities. I don't think they had moved out to the countryside yet, which became their, their major thing after there was that whole uh, thing in, in Shanghai where the Republican troops and the Green Gang in particular slaughtered as many communists as they could get their hands on that was somewhere in the 30s and then it's moved out to a countryside thing and developed into of course the first successful peasant revolt in the history of human beings but you also had all these other warlords there's one warlord in particular who was absolutely as powerful as Chiang Kai-shek and he kind of controlled most of the north while well, Chiang Kai-shek controlled most of the south and there are various other warlords so it was a very strange open almost wild west type era in chinese history right yeah um somewhere in his early early 20s uh liu jing ru became a grammar school teacher and i'm not sure but i've Definitely heard someone say something that it was somewhere around equivalent to what we would consider second or third grade. Mm. And he taught for decades and decades. That was his his straight gig was he was a teacher and he taught little children. And it's interesting because you can kind of see that come through in his martial arts teaching. He's really a, a great teacher in general. He is a teacher no matter what. But he taught grammar school. For a long time. And then in 1957, would have been 21, was when he started studying martial arts with oh, Lo wow. Jing Wu. And Lo Jing Wu was a great martial arts hero. Uh, he's one of the few people in general who managed to traverse in the end of the Qing dynasty. He was a member of the Qing Royal Army. In fact, he was part of Li Wen Biao's 20 braids, where Li Wen Biao trained military men and his top 20 students were his 20 braids. And Li Wen Biao was a disciple of Chen Tinghua, so that's where the Cheng style Bagua came from. And then he transited into getting along fine with the Republic and actually becoming famous in the beginnings of the Sino Japanese War when he was up in Manchuria. And there was a whole thing of he got in some kind of argument with a Japanese officer who was reputed to be the best Japanese swordsman in all of Manchuria. And he lost it and attacked Lo Jing Wu with his katana while Lo Jing Wu was standing there with no weapons. And legend has it that Lo Jing Wu picked up a tree branch, disarmed him, and beat the crap out of him with a tree branch, which that incident alone made him extremely famous and popular. But then he managed to, when uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the Republic took off with a couple of million people and went over to Formosa and renamed it Taiwan and 
took it over and became the overlords of the Formosans, he actually managed to stay with and be in good straits with the People's Republic. Mm. So he continued to be, you know, a martial hero. So somebody that could go from the last dynasty right. to the Republic, to the People's Republic, and stay popular the whole time was pretty amazing character. Mm. And that was Liu Jing Ru's main teacher in Bagua Zhang and Xing Yi Chuan. Although with Xing Yi, he also got to study some with Lao Jing Wu's teacher, who was known as Hao Guang, who was a disciple of the famous Li Sun Yi, or Big Saber Li. And so there was his Bagua and his, his Xing Yi background. Mm-hmm. Frank, um, so I was just trying to count it back. Does that make Liu Jing Ru like fourth generation or fifth? What from from um or third huh? from founding like what is it fourth generation fourth yeah okay fourth I'm fifth you're six right which is but I mean anybody who <laughs> it it's something that people should note because there's a whole lot of people that uh, think that there's like a great teacher and that teacher is something like. I don't know, 10th or 20th generation or something like Liu Jing Ru has an incredible short lineage uh, in in uh, Bagua Zhang. So yeah, well, pretty remarkable. Dung, Dung Ai Chuan taught Chen Tinghua and you got to decide whether you're going to go with the Bagua Zhang lineage or the Chung style Bagua lineage. Right, right. And then, like I said, uh, Li Wen Biao, the military trainer was a disciple of Chen Tinghua, although he was also a student and assistant for Sun Lu Dang. And then he taught Lao Jing Wu, who taught Liu Jing Ru, who taught us. So prior to so, 21, did he have no martial arts background or he had martial arts background and some other stuff? It just started when he, when he was 21 is when he started getting into Bagua. Yeah, I haven't heard of him doing anything else before that, but he may have just considered it insignificant. Right, just like um, stuff sure you learn he, in grade school kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm sure he played around with it. You don't start studying with a great master with having no interest before. Right. But, uh, yeah, and uh, it, was, it was interesting because, as we know, that he, uh, Lao Jing Wu taught in a park, and the park was quite a ways away from where Liu Jing Ru lived. And teaching next to Lao Jing Wu in the park was the great Yang Yu Ting, the Northern Wu style teacher. And living fairly next door to Liu Jing Ru was a student of Yang Yu Ting who happened to be Li Bing Su. And for a few years, the two of them used to ride their bicycles together out to the park to train with their teachers. And they became really good friends to this day. They're really good friends. It was Li Bing Su that introduced us to Liu Jing Ru. But uh, and at the beginning, they both studied with both teachers. But then Liu Jing Ru decided that Tai Chi was too slow for him. You know, he had learned a bunch and he still knows enough to play around with it. But he decided it was too slow and he wanted to do something quicker. And Li Bing Su was already married with a bunch of kids. And I don't know how many by then, but the time they were done... Liu Jing Ru had two kids. Li Bing Su had eight. So he just he didn't have the money to keep training with two teachers. So he settled into his Tai Chi teacher. But the two of them have been friends since way back then when they were starting out with their teachers. Uh, Liu Jing Ru also at one point studied with uh, Chen Tinghua's youngest son, Cheng Yuxing who he got, that's who he learned his 64 hands of Liu Daquan from. And that's who he learned his classical 64 palms of Chung style from. Because what happened was Lao Jing Wu discovered that the old guy was living in some little farming village outside of Beijing and teaching some crappy little school and living a peasant life, even though he was an old great master. And Lao Jing Wu went out and got him, brought him to the city and put him to work in his school. So that um, that's where Liu Jing Ru met him 
So he stud- that's how he got to study directly with the Chung family. And in fact, in our Bagua, we have a move called Sweep the Rider, which is a Shui Jiao move that is really difficult. In fact, you have to have long arms and a long thigh bone, and preferably the person you're doing it to has a thin waist. It's a relatively obscure move. But it's in all of our form because Chen Yuxing explained to Liu Jing Ru that having that in your form shows that you have studied directly with the Chung family. It's a trademark of the Chung family. So that you have a lineage that goes directly to the Chung family. So even though it's a move that I could never pull off, being short limbed and thick waisted, um, <laughs> It couldn't even have it done to me. You couldn't do it either way. But it's still in all of our form because it is the trademark of having a direct lineage to the Chung family. So I all also, of us should have, we should have pride in our sweet the writer. Yes, we should. Because it's, <laughs> even it's though my trademark. hips are like, ah! Yes, it's a trademark of, of our lineage. I also just discovered recently that he also studied with one um, he Jong Chi, who was a grandson of Yin Fu. Mm. So we we'd always knew that Liu Jing Ru knew some Yin Fu style, but I had no idea that he had studied it with a grandson of Yin Fu till mm. I just discovered it recently going through some material on him. So he's studied with a great Lao Jing Wu. Got to study some Xing Yi with Lao Jing Wu's teacher, Hao and Guang, who was, as I said, a disciple of the great Li Sun Yi. Then he studied with Cheng Yu Xing, and then he studied with a grandson of Yin Fu. For so our listeners who don't know who Yin Fu, what Yin Fu is, who Yin Fu is. Well, the two most outstanding students of Deng Hai Chuan, the founder of Bagua Zhang, were Chen Tinghua, and Yin Fu. And Chen Tinghua was a Shui Jiao wrestling champion, henceforth the Sweep the Rider, of, of Beijing when he first started to study with Deng Hai Chuan. Yin Fu was Deng Hai Chuan's very first Bagua student. When he, Originally, he wasn't teaching Bagua to anyone. He was teaching Lohan Shaolin and keeping the Bagua to himself. But he was a tax collector for the Prince Su Wong. So when he got sent to Mongolia to collect taxes, is supposed to be a two or three year trip and he took his top student Yin Fu with him and it ended up being a 10 year trip because trying to convince the Mongolians that they owed taxes to some guy they'd never heard of in Beijing. Mm. The land that had been theirs for centuries didn't necessarily go over well and took a little bit of convincing, which the two of them managed to do. And by the time they had to get the taxes before they came back, but to get a couple of years worth of taxes took them 10 years. And so he got tired of teaching him Lohan after a while, and he taught him Bagua pretty much out of boredom. And so Yin Fu was his very first uh, Bagua student. And the two, made, there are many styles of Bagua, but the two major ones are Yin style and Chung style, and then mixes thereof of Yin and Chung style. And there are a few other disciples. I mean, Deng Hai Chuan's tomb lists 72 disciples. But still, primarily, most of the Bagua that's around today is either Chung style or Yin style. He also studied Six Harmony Mantis from someone named San Xian Ling of Shandong province. And this has become the other style, which we haven't really done with him. But him and his main teachers, assistant teachers, teachers on their own right now, the Han twins, they teach Bagua, Shingi, and Six Harmony Praying Mantis. And Six Harmony Praying Mantis is a northern praying mantis system which has internal elements to it and is often taught in schools where people are doing Shingi and this style of praying mantis. So that's the other style that they tend to teach. Frank, do we have any idea, um, like, when he picked that up? Like, was it significantly after he had already been doing the Bagua Zhang and the um, Xing Yichuan? 
that's the impression I had was that he really had his foundation in those two arts and then at some point studied the, the mantis. That's the impression that I had too, but going back over it, I have no idea where I got that impression. Okay. You know, it's like, it's like, that's the impression that we got, but I have nothing to back that up. Okay. But, but it does seem that way. Hmm. So he's not teaching it that much. The Han twins are teaching it a little bit. He teaches um, on request. Yeah. Liu Jing Ru kind of teaches on, on request these days. Um, Hanyan Ming, I'm not sure. He teaches, but not that much. Hanyan Wu is a big time teacher of Liu Jing Ru's style now. Uh, he teaches in Beijing. He teaches in Italy. He teaches in Australia. He teaches South in Africa, Japan. Yeah. But um, is he teaching the Six Harmony? Or. Like, yes, all of it. I, I don't know if I've seen a yes, lot of it on, fact, on online about it. Well, if you, it you look it up, you can definitely find Han Yan Wu. He loves, he seems to love the Six Harmony Mantis, and he mm. really, really looks good doing it. But he teaches a Bagua, he teaches a Xing Yi. He's been doing some fight choreography for the movies. Um, he was the major Bagua Xing Yi teacher for that Grand Master movie. That and train fact, scene, the, that's that's awesome. Yeah, well, the scene. big, the big, well, the big fight scene in the railroad station, where they start off with she's doing Bagua and he's doing Xing Yi, and then the middle they switch, she's doing Xing Yi and he's doing Bagua, and then they switch back. Well, you can clearly see aspects of Han Yan Wu's personal style in there because he has a certain stylistic thing that's even different from Liu. It's Han Yan Wu's personal style, and they do so really good at showing it because primarily most of us can't copy it at all because it has to do with him starting to train with Liu Jing Ru when he was 12 years old, him and his brother. Mm -hmm. And he's 60 now. He's been training the whole time and he's small and wiry and quick and has loose joints like nobody's business. The Han twins look like they're 25 years old. <laughs> they don't look 60. <laughs> they you look mean like when they're they both move. 25. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah they, when they move. Here when they, they move. look Somebody a little older, like me, but when they move. <laughs> not that much. Um, I mean, if someone like me tried to copy some of those moves, my leg would just tear off at the knee. I'd be standing there holding my lower leg like, what? <laughs> it's like There's just certain things that are them. Of course, they get a big kick out of the Han twins because Han Yan Wu is clearly the older brother and gets <laughs> all the juice of Chinese culture of being the older brother. They're identical twins. He's the older brother by three or five minutes or something, but he's still <laughs> the older brother. It's like... Um, in 1963, at 26... They had a Beijing Bagua Wushu competition, which is the first competition ever called Wushu, I think. And Liu Jing Ru won both the Bagua and the Xing Yi gold medals in that competition. And it turned out to be the last major competition in martial arts before the Cultural Revolution. There wasn't another one until after the Cultural Revolution had been over and cooled down and done and Mao dead and quite a long time before there was any more major national competitions. So the last one, he took the gold in both Bagua and Xing Yi. Um, in fact, there wasn't another one until 1979 when they, they didn't even call it a tournament or a competition, they called it the Wushu Exchange Event. And it took place way down south in Guangxi province. And he won the, the Bagua. And it was the first event since the Cultural Revolution. It was a, a Wushu Exchange Event. And, and he took the Bagua. And it's rather interesting because it was quite a crew. He took the gold. Sun Tzu Zhang took the silver. Zhu Bao Zhen came in fourth. I don't remember or don't know if I was ever told who came in third. But that's quite a crew of people. And this event kind of blows the idea 
of wushu as a bunch of young people doing acrobatics out of the water because not only were they these guys but they claim the average age of all the participants was 43 to 47. So, you know, you had people that had been doing martial arts their whole life and were in their mid-40s were basically the people competing in this gathering. And like I said, they had a very, very strong contingent of Bagua, and Liu Jingru took gold again. Was there a generational gap because of the Cultural Revolution in terms of the transfer of martial arts practice? Like... For those who Not maybe much. aren't familiar with how, how the China, uh, Cultural Revolution affected the martial arts scene. Well, it didn't affect it as much as a lot of martial arts schools tend to make you think. Mm. You generally got the idea that if you were caught practicing martial arts, that they'd put you in jail. Right. And that was not the case. You were not allowed to do public martial arts. You couldn't teach. You couldn't demonstrate. You couldn't publicly do stuff. But if you and your friends i.e. friendly students, wanted to work out in the courtyard of your hutong, no problem. No problem at all. And that's what these guys did. They continued to work out as much as possible. I mean, Lee Bing Sir had a rough time because of those eight kids, and he was making his living <laughs> teaching Tai Chi, and all of a sudden, eight kids, no job. So he spent a number of the early years of the Cultural Revolution delivering vegetables on a bicycle cart, for 10, 11 hours a day. So one would assume he wasn't working out as much as he used to. And then he got a much better job. He became a Kaoya chef. Uh, Kaoya means roast duck. For you, it would be Beijing duck. He became a Beijing duck chef. And that probably gave him more time to train. Liu Jingru was a grammar school teacher, continued to be a grammar school teacher all the way through the thing. He had his gig as a grammar school teacher, and he just trained in the courtyard of his own hutong. And people kind of left him alone. So as long as you were not trying to push it and not trying to be public, yes, it was the cultural revolution where it was a revolution against the old. And they weren't letting people propagate old teachings at all. But if you, you kept to yourself, apparently they would kind of leave you alone. If you didn't, you could get in trouble. I mean, I know a lot of Wang Pei Xing was a Northern Wu style guy, and he went to jail for a long time in the Cultural Revolution. And his students all say, oh, they caught him doing Tai Chi and they put him in jail for, I don't know, seven, eight years. Um, according to the people that we know, he went to jail because he got caught trying to get into Hong Kong without the paperwork. It had nothing to do with his Tai Chi. And that, of course, was a big no no. So. He went to jail for a long time. So it, it was rough. It was, you know, especially bad at the beginning when the Red Guards were let to run completely wild. And you give a bunch of teenagers authority and the right to run around and rest and beat up a bunch of the old people. It's bound to get crazy. But uh, one would think not crazy enough to try it on the old masters anyway. <laughs> but uh it was a rough time. It was a total rough time. People went away and came back. At first, you got arrested for being noted that maybe you were connected to anybody who was a landowner or you'd been a landowner or whatever. But eventually, that started to calm down. And the whole thing was, you know, Mao's wife and her three partners really masterminded the thing and pushed it to all the extremes. And Eventually, when it was over, they, they were the gang of four, and they got executed for doing that. So it was very, very rough times, but it does get exaggerated to a certain extent. And like I said, our two guys just quietly worked out in their, in their courtyard and didn't push it and didn't go public with it and were left alone. And then along came this, this tournament, and you you know three the cultural revolution had been over for three years so they definitely waited and made sure things were going to stay cooled out before they did anything but in 1979 they had this tournament with all these really famous guys competing and our guy walked away as the number one bagua guy uh the next year 1980 they had a second event in uh shansi province 
and Liu Jingru took the the Bagua gold a second time in 1980. And as he tells the story, I didn't find any of the written stuff, but as he tells the story, after that, they asked him not to compete anymore. They told him that it wasn't fair for him to be competing, that there was time to step down and let someone else win. So that was his last competition, it was in 1980. But also in 1980, um, he, leaving Sir and a couple other guys, were allowed to found the Dongchen Martial Arts Academy in Beijing, which is the first academy that was sanctioned to be opened as a public academy since the Cultural Revolution, which had ended four years earlier. So him, our Tai Chi guy, Li Bing Su, and some other people, I think maybe his teacher, Lo Jing Wu, and a couple other people opened up this school in, in Beijing. Uh, as far as the Dongcheng goes, that's a neighborhood in Beijing. It's eastern Beijing. So sometimes you see it as the, the Dongchen Martial Arts Academy, and sometimes you see it as the Eastern Beijing Martial Arts Academy, depending on how far it gets translated. But in 1980, it's like he, he won the tournament. They said, okay, enough competing, but look, you guys can open up this school in Beijing, which they did. And I think he stayed with that school for about 10 years before he branched out on his own. So, Frank, that's literally the first school to open up after the Cultural Revolution in the whole country. Well, the first official school. Right. But still, like, that's actually yes. a pretty remarkable historical event then. Yes. Okay, I, I was completely unaware of that. That's cool. Like I said, those two tournaments that he won. He Well, he won the last big tournament before the Cultural Revolution and the first two big tournaments after the Cultural Revolution. So that's pretty historical also. Yep. And then, of course, he's trained many, many people that won a lot of stuff, including the Han twins are out there winning. Uh, in particular, he had someone whose name escaped me, but some guy won the Bagua five years in a row. Um, like I said, Han, Han Yan Wu was doing forms and fighting competition. Han Yan Wu was winning in Sanda in which he claims that he never really trained any Sanda kickboxing techniques whatsoever, that he was winning in Sanda using his Bagua and Xing Yi techniques. And uh, I have no doubt about that. To this day, it's, he says he'll fight anybody, any size, anywhere, that he doesn't have to wear any padding. If he has to go by sports rules and do padding, he only wants guys his own size. But if they're not going to make him do that, he'll fight anybody, anywhere, anytime. He's a, he's a character. I love him. When we train with him, he comes riding up on his motorbike, little windbreaker jacket, his fingerless gloves. He's a character. He's a real character, and he's really good, really good. I mean, he does Fali. He can stomp on the floor, and the person next to him goes shaking, feels the shaking all the way up their body. It's like, and, and I said, and he's only about at tops 135 pounds, if that. Yeah. He's an absolute terror. Like when you when you feel him move or or anything like whether he just like lays a grip on you or uh, it you really get that strong sense of how martial arts like a very small person can generate incredible power. You have no doubt when you meet him. Like he, he could fight and he could fight much larger people and win. He's amazing. Yeah, I can guarantee that. He likes to demo on me. You know? <laughs> and I mean, with Lee Bin Sir's number one guy now, we do push hand sparring. And I feel like, yeah, yeah, we're the same disciple level. We're both disciples of, of Lee Bin Sir. And when I do stuff with Hanya and Wu, it's like, yeah, yeah, we may both be disciples of Liu Jing Wu, but there's a whole different level thing going on here. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I had a question about um, 
uh, Leo Jing Ru's kind of, you talked about him being a great teacher. Uh, how would you, I know we're going to do a whole episode describing um, specifically training in Beijing, but um, how would you describe his teaching style? Like, uh, is he uh, a stern teacher, uh, a teacher that uh, laughs a lot? Like, how would you describe his teaching style? Well, I think it varies a lot with who he's teaching. And number one, he only teaches who he wants to. And with us, he specifically knows that we travel around the world and we have a fairly short amount of time. So we get an accelerated course. And at the same time, he's got an amazing sense of humor. He used to show up when Li Bing Su was teaching. I mean, with Li Gun Yen, who teaches now that Li Bing Su is in his 90s and retired. He's just, you know, yeah, hi, kid, whatever. But with his old friend, he was hilarious. He'd come in, he'd do stuff like Lee would be putting on a hat, getting on his hat and coat. And Lee would say something. Lee would look slightly miffed and weird. And I'd go, Tina, what did he say? And he said, he asked him, why are you wearing that baby hat? Because he had like a knit cap that stuck up by that didn't. <laughs> he'd, he was known, he'd come in early. This one place where we were training, obviously they had dance classes. And coming early and Lee's doing all this dead serious because Lee was more of a serious teacher. And he's doing his dead serious Tai Chi stuff in the front. And all of a sudden we turn around and Lee has found this par Liu has found this parasol in the back and he's dancing around with the back of the room with his parasol. It's like it's like he he's sometimes he's really hilarious. Hilarious. And like when we had our uh Baisha dinner, like Traditionally, you have to pay for a banquet. But with him, he just brought um, four of his senior students and him. And we went out to dinner with me and Tina had to, to cover the bill. And Jonathan and another one of our students went out with us. And But one of the things was there's a, a thing where, especially, it seems to be going away now. But back then, it was still a thing when you wanted to get the waitress or waiter's attention, you would yell, who you on? which means serving person. And all of a sudden, Liu wanted something. We are in this banquet hall with about 250 people in there. And all of a sudden, he yells, Fu Yuan, and the whole place gets dead silent. And everybody turns around and looks at him because he had projected his voice. It was, was loud, but it was just there was a projection of his voice. I swear to God, about 250 people stopped dead and turned around and looked at him. And the waiter came over very quickly. But... <laughs> He's, he's fun to be around and uh, really, really good guy, as well as an amazing martial artist and, and an amazing teacher. And at the same time, though, we were at uh, a class one day and one of Li Bing Su's students came out and I saw them talking and I saw him shaking his head and her looking dejected and whatnot. And I asked Tina what happened. He said, well, she just went up and told him that she had 15 women from her job that wanted him to teach and they would give him what was a fair amount of money. And he just said, no, 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 I'm not interested. He's got done teaching us. He knew he was teaching this relatively small group of foreigners. He's like, no, nah, I'm not interested. And uh, look for somebody else and walked off. He wouldn't teach him. Mm. So he's, he's an interesting and complex man. I think his teaching style, Frank, maybe comes a little bit from uh, being a grade school teacher so much. So uh, at one point, I taught English in Brazil and was teaching teenagers a lot. And I came to the conclusion that you have to keep their attention. And to do that, you have to kind of be entertaining. And so I feel like Liu Jingru commands attention he, he's joking with us a lot, but he he's very skilled at commanding attention around him, um, which I think, uh, yeah, I think it directly relates to to uh, having had to deal with small children who are easily distracted a lot. Um, you never I mean, it's not like he's forcing attention. He just commands attention naturally. Yeah, he's really good at it. I had a teacher um, at one point who, like, and trying to tell us how to teach, and we were really 
drilling in the basics. That's the person that I got all this really hardcore basic stuff from. And he used to say, drill them, make them work hard. Drill them, make them work hard. Then stop, do something to dazzle them for a minute. Then go back to drill them, make them work hard. Drill them, make them work hard. And it works, you know. Un unfortunately, the dazzle them usually began with, come here, Frank. And then it was me getting flying through the air, or slamming into the wall or hitting the floor or whatever. But they were dazzled. And then we'd go back to working, <laughs> working really hard again. Um, it's good. And then another thing, like I've discussed with some of my friends, is there's a difference between teaching and trying to show the students how much you know. There are some teachers that rarely teach anything. They just continually make sure the students know that they know more than they do, that they can do stuff they can't, that they can do this dazzling stuff, and they barely ever teach. They just spend all their time doing that. Um, I had a couple of friends of mine were teaching together, and one of them complained that that's all the other one did. It he'd be working people really hard in one side of the room, and the other guy would be drawing all the people over to see him do something else semi-miraculous. So there's a whole thing of, of making sure as a teacher that you teach also. And Liu Jingru clearly does that. Clearly, he's a teacher. Like I say, he's a teacher's teacher. He's a grammar school teacher. He's a martial arts teacher. He could probably teach anything because he's a teacher. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I get the impression, too, that he um, definitely places a lot of importance in propagating the art because... You know, you can find them all online. I'm sure there's, um, you know, I mean, he can get paid a lot of money for the stuff that he's he's kind of showing for free online. Um, I don't know how much is approved to be shared, but I know that he's done a lot of work in creating some content, videos, DVDs. Um, you know, you can find them all on YouTube. And I, 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 I always get impressed by that as well. Because sometimes, like you're saying, Frank, you'll have these teachers who are not really teaching. In fact, they're doing the they're anti teaching. They're kind of like just showing off and kind of not revealing anything to their students. And then you have someone like uh, Leo Jingru, who's actually going above and beyond and trying to propagate the art around the world, I think, and trying to get more more and more people to know about it and expose to it. And um and also I, I'm also always just impressed when someone is getting into their golden years and can move at a certain level. Um, it, it's, it's just really remarkable to see that, you know? Yeah, he is one of the biggest promoters of his arts, particularly Bhagavad in the world. I mean, besides, and I'll get, get you back to this thing of these little film clips, which is a whole aside to that also, but he has a whole series of books that he keeps writing more and more books in fact, we're thrilled. we actually got our pictures in a couple of them. But uh, he's writing these books. He's doing filming over and over again, different filming. He was going up until recently, going places wherever they wanted him to go and showing the arts. And he is one of the biggest propagators of the arts. And in fact, that when you get above six duan, the rest of it, a lot of it has to do with how much you do in promoting the arts, a lot of it. So him getting that ninth duan, a lot of it's recognition of him being one of the uh, the greatest promoter of Bhagwajang in the country also. Now, as far as these clips, though, him and some other people have told us that originally there was a whole set of them done. And what they did originally was they called them in and they paid them once to shoot it. And then these things have been reprinted and redone and shown here and shown there for decades. And the people that did it never see another dime. They got a fairly minimal amount to do it in the first place. And then that was it. They never got anything else. But then doing stuff to promote your martial arts in general doesn't necessarily do that much. Tina and I have our books out through North Atlantic Books. And like we just got our six month royalty checks for like I think I got thirty two dollars and seventy five cents. It's like <laughs> there isn't any real money in it whatsoever. But it's kinda like being a professor in publishing. It's good for your reputation, it's good for the arts, it's a, a general good thing, but it certainly doesn't make any money. So I guess the final question I have for both of you, 
maybe both of you can tackle this separately, is, um, you know, with working with him and others over the years, but more specifically with him because we're doing the show on him, how has it affected your teaching styles um, or the way that you think about the art? Frank, you could tackle it first if you want. Well, um, like I said, I've recognized it's a whole different thing. When you're teaching the same people over and over again, week after week, it's not the same as when he gets us for a few days and knows we travel around the world to be there. So he teaches in this crash course style, which I will do a bit of in my workshops, but it's a whole different thing than teaching my regular classes. And I would imagine it's a whole different thing than when he taught people regularly also. Because like I said, specifically paying attention to us, and it does help to realize that it's good to tailor your teaching to who you're teaching. Because he absolutely tailors it to the fact of who we are, where we came from, how much we can absorb and, and get as much as possible that we can possibly absorb in the amount of time that we have. He's really good that way. So you learn to tailor your teaching to the students and the circumstances more so than to copy exactly how he's going about it. Well, and John, maybe that goes into your answer because I know you've talked a lot about how um, a lot of the customization of the arts you can see in, in, in different masters, especially Leo Jingru with his expression of the art. So how's he affected your training? So the training, um, I think that uh, there's been a few things that have really strongly made impressions on me. Um, one of them was uh, he talked a little bit about things that he does himself on a daily basis. And, and one of them was walking, which I don't think that everyone fully appreciates how foundational footwork is to Bagua Zhang and how, uh, like he said, what did he say, Frank? Something like 45 minutes of just that walking. And then he was sort of what, freestyle, freestyling what, hand movements, but. 45 minutes of mud tread stepping, but not necessarily in a circle. When he'd right. have us work with what he was doing, it was more like a snaking type movement around the studio. Yeah, and also just snaking back and forth. And but the whole idea was to do your chung style mud tread stepping all the way and make sure that you were doing your mud tread stepping correctly. And then he did a variety of different hand movements that I think he'd just pick up off the top of his head as something to amuse his upper body while well, he was the main practice was doing this mud tread stepping for a long period of time. And that seemed to be the foundation of his personal training was this intense mud tread stepping with a variety of, of hand movements. Right. So that for me, in, in terms of my own practice, really brought me back to this idea of what, you know, foundational work and everybody, everybody that trains Bagua Zhang is told that the stepping is and the, the footwork is the foundation. But when you meet and train with the highest level master that's alive, and that's what he tells you again, what he personally does. He's, he's not talking about training some high level set or something as his constant practice, his daily practice, the, 45 minutes of, of just the walking. The other stuff is like Frank said, it seems to not be, he wasn't trying to generate power in the upper body. He was sort of doing a lot of coiling types of movements in the upper body, but he emphasized that really the foundation is the walking, um, which again, walking in Bagua Zhang is actually sort of an equivalent practice to the standing that's used as a foundational practice in other martial arts, uh, other internals. So again, it's bringing it back to that idea of keep training the foundational stuff because Bagua Zhang, none of the rest of it is um, very special if you don't 
understand. And if you don't really have that rooted walking, which, um, I mean, Frank has done lots of discussions of uh, different types of rooting and, and how Bagua Zhang has this very unique thing about being highly, highly mobile, but also rooted. Uh, so it's, it's really an important aspect of the training. So for my personal practice, that's the definitely the thing. Um, and then looking at him as a teacher, I think that uh, it's more, I can't say that it has affected my teaching as much as it is something to aspire towards, which is commanding that presence, you know, having that sense of, you don't have to grab, like, like snap at people for, for getting distracted by things because no one's getting distracted when he's teaching, everybody's paying attention. And that's a pretty remarkable skill in and of itself. So that's, that's something to aspire to that I, I well, hopefully <laughs> over time will develop. Like I said, he's a teacher. He's a teacher's teacher. By the way, our quick analogy in this rooting thing is Tai Chi and Xingyi root like trees. Bagua roots like strawberries. <laughs> You're not going to explain it, Frank? <laughs> Just leave it there like a, yeah, yeah. Like we'll, a cohen? <laughs> or a... Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it at some other point when we're talking about draining. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> cool. All right, anything to add on, on Leo General? Well, just that he's the best teacher that's out there. And, and I've had a lot of really good teachers. I've had some that weren't, but I've had a lot of really, really good teachers. And he's just a joy to train with. I mean, I've had people that I learn tons with, and I, I really can't thank him enough for the amount of stuff, amount of important material that I got from them. But it all felt like pulling teeth and, you know, you're, you're going through this so that you can get this material. Whereas with Liu Jing Ru, you look forward to seeing him. You know, you're learning wonderful stuff in a good manner from a, one of the best in the world, but you, you're happy to go there. You, you want to show up. You want to spend some time with him. So that makes it's pretty amazing in the teaching world for him to have that. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and definitely, too, uh, we're going to, um, you know, you, everyone sees the video uh, at the end um of the guy training so if you don't know who that was now you know um at the end of our podcast for those who are watching it on youtube uh but definitely i i have um some cool links to different resources that he's put out there and, and we have some um other video that you might have uh if you didn't see it if you weren't watching the video version of this um go to youtube and watch the video version of this podcast because there's little clips that we've dropped in um some exclusive uh video of him doing some work so, yeah, so I also promised um, at the end of this episode that we do some thank you so, to some of our uh, listeners and viewers, uh, specifically those who have been dropping reviews on iTunes. Um, so Frank and John, maybe there's some people who have like affiliate names, but I think you might know who they are. So I'm at. I, I'm gonna say their affiliate, their their little you know nickname on iTunes, and maybe you can decipher who they are, and we can give them a shout out. Some are more obvious, obviously. You know, John and I drop reviews. You know, we got to be on there as well. So thank you, John, for giving a review. Um, then we got uh, Jacob from Detroit who dropped a review recently. So that that was a nice one, um, and it was a really well thought one. Just saying how uh, great of a you know, podcast, what this was, especially around the internal martial arts. Um, he's been practicing for over 35 years and he says nothing compares online to the um, stuff that we're dropping. Um, awesome. And he also said we have a little academic uh, feel to us. So I don't know how we feel about it. You feel academic, Frank? Occasionally. <laughs> yeah, nice. And then we got uh, uh, Wiry Wolf. I think I know who that is. You think? You yeah, know who yeah. That is? That, absolutely. Who's absolutely. That? that that's my boy Marcos. Yes, Marcos. So thanks for the review, Marcos. Um, then we have um, poetic. 
Idada or Poetic Da? I don't know. Edda. Edda. Oh, Edda, Edda, Edda. There he goes. You know, as, as in, in the north. Um, I'm not sure. Could be Jack. He's a poet. But, Could I mean. One of your Scandinavian students or. Didn't you have a guy in Norway, Frank? Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Because they um, did specifically referring to the Eddas were like the, like the Viking Age uh, poems and sagas and things, right? Yeah, they were most of the, <laughs> all the Viking writings of their own about themselves were done as the Eddas. Most of them came from uh, Iceland. But uh, there you go. yeah, I'm not not real sure. I mean, it could be Marcos again. He loves <laughs> Viking stuff. But uh, as I said, it could be Jack. He's a poet. I guess it could be Norwegian Tom. Nice. Um, and then uh, that the last could... one I have here is uh, K. Lizzie. I think we know who that is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, first off, it's pronounced Clizzy. Clizzy. <laughs> and yeah, yeah and, and that's Kate. That's yeah. Kate, longtime student of mine. Nice, Clizzy. I like that name. All right, cool, yeah. So, yeah, so as people drop reviews on iTunes, um, We'll give you a shout out on the podcast. So thank you all for writing those reviews and taking the time to do so. Um, it's, it's not hard to do, but it's a little bit tricky. Uh, but if you look in the show notes of our, our podcast here, you'll find uh, the links to go ahead and write those reviews. And it helps for sure with getting us more uh, listeners and viewership and all that good stuff with the algorithms that um, Apple has and you know all the other podcast streamers. And then, of course, um, if you're following us on YouTube and subscribing, make sure you hit the little chime bell so that you can get notified whenever we put out uh, a new episode. For those who don't know, our episodes go live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a live premiere. So it's not recorded live, right, because we're pre-recording this, but it's premiering live. So it's a it's a, a full run through of the of the show for those who don't know how YouTube works a full run through um, where we're actually there. John is usually on there, I think, with me, um, but we're there watching it live with everybody. So if everyone, if, if you want to get on there, watch it live, and even ask questions, comments, you can do that, and you'll have um, the live chat so you can uh, talk to us. Frank doesn't get on the, the live that often. Every once in a while, you'll pop in, I think. You, you got confused about what the live was at first, I think. You're like, I can't rewind it. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so that's every Wednesday, though, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So join us for those. Uh, but if not, of course, you can always watch the episodes after that. Um, and we, we got a little collection going on now. So that's uh, really exciting to see. We've gotten through about uh, f three to four months of the, the podcast. And it's great to provide all this content to everybody. Awesome. Frank, any, any last words? Uh, what's going on with the school? No, no, the usual stuff. I mean, we're hopefully March will bring spring, which will bring a beginning of a return to live classes in the yard. But you never know. You know, March in like a lion, out like a lamb, in like a lamb, out like a lion. So, but hopefully we're going to get at least a, a bare beginnings of getting the yard classes going. And from now on, the yard classes aren't going to be just yard classes. They're going to be hybrid classes. So there'll be yard and Zoom simultaneously. So we've never done that before, so that ought to be interesting. And, you know, Wednesdays and Fridays are always a special class. Some of those will change a bit. And we'll begin with Wednesday still Zoom and Friday hybrid. And then hopefully by April, Wednesdays and Fridays will be hybrid classes and other than that we've got a you know it'll still be 20 classes a week so there's lots of variety and lots to choose from i see john chuckling am, over there i am looking forward to seeing how these hybrid classes work because i'm just imagining frank uh <laughs> Billy Banks has been in some sort of a commercial again recently, the Tybo guy. And so I'm picturing Frank with the headset being like, that, 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 that. <laughs> and, like, and the students <laughs> all. <laughs> oh, Tybo, Tybo. John, you got any, you, you teaching any classes right now, John? Uh, I am any, not. You got anything, you got anything planned for the spring? Uh, John, you tell me. We're, we're, we, we work collab <laughs> cooperatively. Uh, 
so I mean, it would be great if we started getting some some training together uh, in the park or something. Um, so let's let's talk about that and and get on that. For sure. Awesome. All right. Cool. Sounds like all good things. And uh, we'll be back, of course, next week, next Wednesday. Um, so stay tuned for all the goodies that we're going to bring. Have a great week, guys. You too. Thanks.